Hello, and welcome to this nature.com custom webcast titled Bioengineering Custom Cell Microenvironments with Versatile Maskless Photo Patterning. My name is Jay Shane Carpen, and I will be your moderator. Today's webcast is sponsored by Alveoli. We'll begin the webcast with presentations from Dr. Manuel Thierry and Dr. Harry Krishnan Paramashwaran, and then end with a Q&A session. To ask a question, just type it in where it says type your question here and then press submit at any point during the webcast and we will answer them today. And now over to Manuel. Hello, welcome to this webcast dedicated to the use of versatile, maskless photo patterning method for the bioengineering of custom cell microenvironments. My name is Manuel Terry and I'm directing research programs at the Cytomorpho Lab in Paris and in Grenoble, in France. I will give the first part of this presentation and then we'll let Dr. Hari Krishnan Parameswaran from Northeastern University to cover the second. The art of cell micropatterning consists in finding ways to confine cells in controlled geometries. Several methods have been developed to achieve this and they will be discussed in the second part of this presentation with a particular emphasis on the advantage of a new, contactless, and maskless patterning method. But first, I will uh, briefly give an overview of the seminal works which have opened this field 30 years ago. Then I will argue that, although artificial, micropatterns are far from being artifactual. On the opposite, when used wisely, micropatterns can reveal the key morphogenetic rules that are at play in living tissues. So this all started um, in 1996 with this seminal work by this British group who found a way in order to, to make some circular adhesive islands for cells of different sizes. And they found it that uh, as the cell size increased, the proportion of cells that were synthesizing DNA and thus uh, undergoing divisions was getting higher and higher. So the larger the cells, the faster they grow. Two years later, they add some additional results showing that not only the growth was getting higher, but as shown here by the involucrine rate, also the differentiation of these uh, epidermal cells, epidermal cells was getting lower. So proliferation and differentiation was responding in opposite ways to the increase of cell size. Ten years later, the group of Donald Dingber collaborated with the lab of George Whiteside in order to develop a new micropatterning method, allowing them to control in a much better way the shape in which the cells were confined. In particular, they were able to make patterns made of dots in, instead of being continuously adhesive in order to show that it was actually the cell spreading area rather than the cell adhesion area which determines the ability of cells to grow or differentiate. In particular, Christopher Chen, the first author of this study published in Science, when he started his own lab, showed that when cells were confined of patterns of different shapes and different sizes and submitted to a cocktail of differentiation uh, cytokines, could differentiate toward completely opposite lineage depending on the size on which the cells were confined. Mesenchymal stem cells spread on large patterns would differentiate into uh, the osteoblast, whereas those confined on tiny islands would become adipocytes. So these examples showed the major roles played by geometrical constraint on cell survival and uh, fate. Now, in the next slide, I want to argue that in vivo, in general, cells are submitted to geometrical, structural, and mechanical constraints that direct their intracellular organization and the way they behave in tissues. When cultured in vitro, all this information is lost and cells are now on infinite, uniform, stiff, and static substrate. But by using micropatterns, it is possible to recover, uh, recapitulate uh, the constraint that the cells are submitted 
to in vivo and allow them to uh, orient in space again. Now I'll give a few examples showing that geometrical constraint first direct cell architecture and cell contractility and that this feature will further guide the cell polarity, the cell migration, the cell division and the cell differentiation. First, let's look at the cell architecture. In this example, we can see on the left that macro patterns can be used in order to force the cells to spread on heterogeneous macro pattern. For example, here they can attach to the two bar of the V-shape and they cannot attach in the central part in between. And on this specific part, cells will form stress fibers, which are contractile actomyosin fibers, where they produce uh, traction forces. So cells contract specifically upon non-adhesive regions. And this is exactly what happens exactly also in vivo. For example, in this example on the right, when a wound is formed on uh, the tissue of a, drosophila, of a drosophila, and the wounded cells at the periphery of the wound uh, form this supracellular cable contracting and helping the wound to close. So these two examples show that cells on micro patterns and in vivo share the same feature that is contracting upon non-adhesive regions. Micro patterns can also be used to confine uh, several cells on the same geometry and see how they interact. And in this example shown on the left, we can see that two cells form intercellular junctions and polarize towards this junction as shown by the location of the centrosome next to the contact between the two cells, which is exactly what happened here on the right during the formation of the intestinal tube during the development of a C. elegans embryo. As cells then uh, leave the cell cycle and become quiescent and differentiate, they form a primary cilium. And it is, it is known that contruency is required for the cilium to happen. And indeed, on macro patterns on the left, it is clear that these cells have both left the cell cycles and only those that are confined on small geometries can grow a primary cilium, whereas those that are spread cannot. And that's exactly what happened during the development of uh, the mouse retina, shown here on the right, when confined cells after two days can grow primary cilium, and as the development progress and the cells spread more and more, the cells lose the ability to form cilium. So these two examples show that in micro patterns and in vivo, only specially confined cells can get ciliated. This slide is about cell migration. It has been studied for a long time on 2D substrate, later on 3D matrices made of collagen fibers, and what this work of Ken Yamada shows is that micro pattern lines can recapitulate exactly the way, the mechanism by which cells migrate and um, the, the, the process by which they form protrusions and drag the cell body. And micro patterns can be used also to vary the width of those lines and then the speed at which the cells move. Not only these fibers recapitulate the actual fibers, collagen fibers that can be seen in vivo here on the, on the right, but also the fact that cells tend to move one after the other, making a cue as they move on the fiber as they do uh, in vivo. The cell division process can also be studied on micro pattern. And here on the left, what can be seen is that on these control geometries, it, can, it is clear that when the spindle uh, mitotic spindle form, the pole gets oriented toward the adhesive sides of the rounded cell. And this is exactly what was seen on the, on the right in the skin, in the epidermal uh, cells of the mouse skin, when cells tend to uh, orient their spindle poles toward the contact with the basement membrane. And when cell adhesion was impaired, mitotic spindles become random. So here also, both in vivo and on macro patterns, one can see that the spindle poles tend to orient toward the adhesive cues. Finally, I decided to show this example about the cell differentiation. At, here it's at a much larger scale. It can be seen that cells, uh, here the, the scale bar is 100 micron, and it's a large group of mouse embryonic stem cells. 
and as their uh, differentiation is initiated, they form concentric layers of uh, different uh, differentiation patterns that, is, that recapitulate exactly the concentric layers that can be seen in the developing uh, mouse embryo. So, generally, this example illustrates how geometrical constraints are key parameters to orient not only cell architectures and cell shape, but also the way they polarize, migrate, divide, and differentiate in vivo and uh, on micro patterns. So it is now time to discuss how we can ma manufacture those micro patterns in order to study all these important processes. So there are several milestones through which the field has progressed uh, as it, uh, over the years. So the first method was the microcontact printing, during which you need to make to microstructures in order to mold uh, a gel on it and use this gel in order to ink and print protein onto glass. The second method that has been developed was the photo patterning, in which you don't need a stamp, but directly use a photo mask, which is a commercial product that, you, that is put in contact uh, with a the glass substrate that you want to pattern, shine some deep UV light through the mask in order to burn the cell repellent coating on the slide and then graft some proteins on it. Both methods need to come into contact with the substrate you want to work with. Later on, a third method has been developed which was the laser patterning with which you don't need this contact and a laser can be used at distance in order to scan uh, the substrate of interest in order and remove the cell repellent coating. So these three methods have different uh, pros and cons. Recently, the company Aldeol has launched a new device allowing any lab to micro pattern any kind of substrate with PIMO, which is an optical device that fits on an inverted microscope. In this device, you will find a UV laser source, an optical setup to expand the beam, as well as a set of mirrors and lenses in order to expose the entire surfaces of a DMD chip. A DMD chip is made of thousands of micro mirrors. Each micro mirror can switch between two positions on and off. And when the macro mirror is on, then the light is reflected toward the objective. And when it's off, let's say that the light is lost. Thus, by controlling the positioning of each macro mirror of the chip, a UV image, which means a virtual mask, is generated, goes through the objective, and reaches the glass cover slit, the plastic petri dish, the PDMS layer, or whatever you want to work with. The DMD is controlled by a dedicated software, Leonardo, in which images are drawn on your favorite software, ImageJ, PowerPoint, Illustrator, are loaded. The software allows to use any images. You can also preview your pattern and align it with the substrate you are working with. Using Primo and Leonardo, you can thus pattern any kind of image in a few minutes without any photo mask or macrofabricated stamps. Pattern shape can then be changed and improved every day in order to better uh, follow and adapt to your ongoing experiments. Leonardo can also pattern large images that are bigger than the DMD size or the field of your microscope by subdividing into several parts the large image and using the motorized stage to expose them sequentially and reconstitute the whole image on your substrate. I'll give you a few examples after. So here is a description of the few steps in this macro patterning process. The first critical step, of course, is to treat your working substrate, which can be a glass slide, a petri dish, a layer of PDMS, with an anti-fooling polymer, usually a polyethylene glycol, to make it non-adhesive. Then the photo initiator is put on the substrate to make it light sensitive. The second step is to use uh, PRIMO, the optical modules, in combination with Leonardo, the software, to project an image onto the substrate. 
during this exposure to the light, uh, the PLPP will burn the peg layer and remove the anti-fooling molecules that will be released in this, uh, from the substrate exactly where the light is shining. The fourth step consists in the washing out of uh, this photoinitiator and incubation with the proteins that are then allowed to adsorb specifically where the UV light has been projected. The last step is then to seed the cells which can now attach specifically onto the pattern of adhesive proteins. So in contrast with classical methods that are black uh, based on photomask or printing, which are black and white pictures, uh, binar binar binarized pictures, this technique allowed the formation of some gradients so that the density of light can also be turned into a density of proteins. In this example, you have, can take any picture here on the left, shine this picture on the substrate of interest and convert the light into density of proteins. Here, this is fluorescent fibronectin that has been grafted on light on the picture on the right and the scale bar is 100 microns. With the same approach, you can use your picture of interest, shine it through the microscope and graph proteins and then cells. And here it's a large image with many cells that are covering the outline of uh, the characters that are on that image. One interesting use of this PRIMO technology is to make gradients. Indeed, as this technology uses virtual mass, the system can project levels of ray and therefore create gradients. This example shows how uh, the density of proteins can impact uh, cell migration. So as you can see on the left, lines of high intensity of proteins, uh, vertical lines have been crafted with a high density of proteins, whereas horizontal lines have gradients. And the movie on the right shows that cells will preferentially attach to the high density of protein and progressively over time invade the less dense uh, adhesive part. The next example shows another main advantage of this technique is that it can be used sequentially, meaning that light can be projected in the presence of living cells. In this example, a first macro pattern has been done, so cells are confined here on this rectangle on the left. And afterward, the UV light is used to release some cage RGD peptide so that can, cells can attach again in the region that will be exposed afterwards. In this video, you can see that lines have been exposed on the right part of the rectangles so that the cells on the left can now invade on the lines that have been exposed in the presence of living cells, making it possible to have active control of uh, live cell migration. In the next slide, it is shown how uh, multiple proteins can be patterned on the same slide. So the interest of PRIMO is that it can use alignment in order to, to re repeat the step of light exposure in order to graph different proteins at distinct locations by simply repeating the grafting step. So in the in the picture, you can see a cross with some disc with different proteins, but you can also overlay, overlap the different proteins in order to make some complex features, such as in the reproduction of the painting here in the bottom on the left. You can also graph cells sequentially, as shown on the right, by this picture, uh, as, it, as exemplified on this picture of the Eiffel Tower, in which uh, first, um, Bread cells were uh, grafted onto the floors of the, of the Eiffel Tower and after uh, green cells were loaded in the crosses in between the floors. So all these examples show how you can graft multiple proteins, multiple cells at once or in multiple steps on a, on a single uh, 2D substrate which can be a gel or a glass slide. In the, in the next example, uh, it is shown that you can also use uh, the PRIMO optic modules 
in combination with Leonardo in order to make the ma macro uh, structures. So, for example, a photosensitive hydrogel or a photosensitive uh, resist can be exposed to light, and as shown in this movie, simply the exposure can be used to polymerize the hydrogel or the photoresist. And then the washing away of non-polymerized regions uh, can be used to reveal the topology of, in that example, the macro welds that have been fabricated this way. In the next slide, it, it is shown that the microstructures can also be combined with micro patterning. So in this work, um, proteins have been specifically grafted either in the bottom of the micro welds or on the side of the micro welds so that cells can be confined in 3D wells but their shape can also be controlled within the wells because they can't attach to the entire well but only to specific regions in the bottom and on the side of the, of the wells. So this combination between 3D topology and patterning can also apply to closed microfluidic devices. The um, photo initiator can be inserted into the microfluidic channels and exposed to UV light. As shown in this movie, after the washing out of uh, the photo initiator and the proteins, macro patterns are revealed in the bottom of the microfluidic uh, chambers. So thereby, this technique, because it does not require to have any contact with the substrate, can allow the fabrication of macro patterns that are in the macrofluidic chambers aligned with the topology of uh, the fluidic uh, circuitry. And finally, uh, the PRIMO device and the UV that are generated can be used not only to polymerize some substrate, but also to degrade some substrate. And here, it's the process of photoscission that has been used uh, in this very recent work uh, in the team of Vincent Studer in Bordeaux, in France, and it's now published on uh, BioArchive. And it's a chemical mechanism that allows to degrade many different hydrogels, whether they are photosensitive or not. And the details of this photoscission mechanism done with Primo can be found in the preprint paper, as well as other generic structuration and functionalization methods. So now that we have uh, given a global and quite general overview of the mechanism by which cells are sensitive to geometrical cues in tissues and on macro patterns, as well as some of the methods in order to make those macro patterns on 2D and on 3D structures, it's time for me to let the Dr. Hare Krishnan Parameswaran to explain you a particular application uh, that he has made in, to use uh, to study the contraction of airway cells thanks to uh, Primo Macro Pattern. Thanks, Manuel. And now over to Hari Krishnanan. Thank you, Manuel. My name is Hari Krishnan Parameshwaran, and I am a faculty in bioengineering at Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts. Today, I'm going to talk to you about a recent study from my lab where we looked at how extracellular matrix stiffness regulates force transmission among human airway smooth muscle cells. The clinical problem that drives this work is asthma. Asthma is a respiratory condition that affects approximately 300 million people worldwide. The characteristic feature of asthma is illustrated in the figure shown in the slide. Let us assume that you breathe in a very small dose of agonist. Now, if you are a healthy individual, your airway stay open and you would feel absolutely no difficulty in breathing. However, if you are an asthmatic who inhales exactly the same dose, your airways would narrow in an exaggerated fashion. This phenomenon is known as airway hyperreactivity. Asthma is currently thought of as a disease of the smooth muscle brought about by sustained inflammation in airways which causes smooth muscle to generate more tension. However, recent studies have shown that smooth muscle contractility is not increased in asthma. Now that is counterintuitive because we know that small airways in asthmatics do constrict in response to agonist. To better understand this anomalous observation, 
we need to consider the smooth muscle in its natural extracellular environment. We know that the extracellular matrix in airways undergoes dramatic changes in composition and stiffness with the onset of asthma. But very little is known about how the extracellular matrix can influence airway constriction. How does an airway narrow? Shown in the figure is a schematic of an airway cross section. Now starting from the inner lumen and moving outwards, you have the mucus lining shown in green, the pink epithelial layer, and right behind the epithelium is the layer of smooth muscle cells. In order to generate enough force to effect a change in the luminal area, the contractile apparatus of individual smooth muscle cells must physically connect with each other to form a force transmission pathway that wraps around the circumference of the airway. Smooth muscle cells have two potential pathways by which they can connect with each other. They can either form direct cell-cell contacts and transmit force via these cell-cell contacts from one cell to its nearest neighbor, or they can connect to elements of the extracellular matrix like collagen and transmit forces over long distances indirectly through the matrix. Both these possibilities exist. Currently, we know very little about the factors that influence force transmission within this smooth muscle layer. In this talk, we will address three specific questions. Question 1. In healthy human airways, do smooth muscle cells transmit forces through cell-cell contacts or do they transmit forces through cell-ECM coupling? Question 2. Does the nature of connectivity affect the overall contractility of the multicellular ensemble of smooth muscle cells? And question 3. Can remodeling of the ECM as seen in asthma alter the nature of the force transmission pathway and what does it mean for the overall contractility of the smooth muscle ensemble? In order to answer these questions, we wanted to measure the force that a cell exerts on its nearest neighbor. As shown in the figure on the left, it has been shown that if you can isolate a two-cell pair with a boundary that is clearly visible, the force on the cell-cell junction can be measured as the average of the unbalanced traction force that each cell exerts on the matrix. In the case of the smooth muscle cell, not only do you want a two-cell pair, the cells must be arranged in such a way that the contractile axes are aligned in the same direction. Which brings us back to the micropatterning techniques that Manuel talked about in the beginning. In this study, we used a rectangular pattern of 150 microns by 15 microns to obtain two cell pairs as shown in the figure in the middle. Determining the dimensions and aspect ratio of the rectangle for a new cell type requires trial and error. And this will take a really long time if you are using traditional techniques. Fortunately, we have the Primo photo patterning system that Manuel mentioned in my lab. And so we were able to do this uh, in a matter of weeks. So in the end, we decided to go with 150 by 15 microns, which is a trade-off between confining the cells too much versus actually getting just two cells instead of three or four cells in a pattern. Shown in the figure on the left is a composite image showing a rectangular pattern of fluorescent gelatin in green and superimposed on it is a face contrast image of two human airway smooth muscle cells whose nuclei are labeled in blue. Notice that the border between the cells is visible in the face contrast image without additional labeling. The two cell pair sits on the surface of a new cell gel material which has beads spin coated on top. By tracking the motion of these beads, we can get a displacement map indicated by the green arrows. From the displacement map, we can back out a traction field and knowing the boundary between the cells, we can split this traction field in two, one corresponding to each cell in the two cell pair. Shown in the figure on the right are blue arrows indicating the traction field corresponding to the cell on the left and yellow arrows corresponding to the traction field for the cell on the right. The force that each cell exerts on the cell-cell junction, FJ cell, can be calculated as the unbalanced traction force. We can also calculate the average longitudinal tension of the ASM cell according to this formula where Tn is the traction force vector corresponding to the computational grid N 
and Rn is the position vector corresponding to the nth computational grid. The x-axis is aligned parallel to the contractile axis of the ASM cell pair and the origin is set at the midpoint of the border shown by a blue dot. The Nusel gel that we use in this study is a proprietary PDMS substrate whose stiffness can be tuned in the range 300 pascal to 40 kilopascal. The airways that collapse in asthma are small airways with a diameter of 3 mm and lower and we have previously shown that the ECM of these airways have a Young's modulus of the order of 100 pascal. There are no measurements of ECM stiffness in asthmatic airways. We assume that the ECM stiffness increases in asthmatic airways. The average magnitude of the force exerted on the cell-cell junction is plotted in figure on the left for healthy Young's modulus of 300 pascal and remodeled ECM Young's modulus of 13 kilopascal. We found that as ECM stiffness increases, the force on the cell-cell junction increases significantly. In figure on the right, we show changes in average longitudinal tension of the ASM cells. In line with several previous studies, we find that in our two cell pairs, the longitudinal tension increases significantly with the increase in ECM stiffness. This means that the force exerted on the cell-cell junction is not a reliable indicator of cell-cell coupling strength as this quantity will always increase as traction force increases. To normalize for this effect, we calculate a dimensionless ratio phi which is indicative of the mechanical coupling between cells and is defined according to the formula shown in the box. Phi measures the fraction of the cell's longitudinal tension that it exerts on the boundary with values closer to 1 indicative of a stronger cell-cell coupling. For ASM cells, phi decreased significantly as the substrate stiffness was increased from 300 pascal to 13 kilopascal, indicating that the ASM cells can potentially physically decouple from each other as ECM stiffness is increased. To verify this result, we image the cells after fluorescently staining for markers of cell-cell and cell-ECM adhesion. To verify our mechanical measurements of cell-cell coupling strength, we imaged our two cell ensembles after staining for beta catenin, which is an adherence junction marker, vinculin, which is a focal adhesion marker, and the nucleus with tapping. Images of the cell stained at three different stiffnesses are shown in the figure. On substrates mimicking ECM stiffness of healthy tissue, E is equal to 300 pascal, the border between the ASM cells is well defined by the beta catenin stain, indicating the presence of a strong ASM ASM cell border. As ECM stiffness increases to E is equal to 13 kilopascal, well-defined focal adhesions start to develop at the ASM-ASM cell border, which are shown in yellow arrows in the middle panel. At E is equal to 40 kilopascal, the adherence junctions and the cell-cell border disappear completely and focal adhesions can be seen at the border, indicated by yellow arrows. Now, the two-cell ASM ensemble separates into two individual ASM cells that are connected through the ECM. There is no functional border of adhesion junctions between the ASM cells at, at E is equal to 40 kilopascal. It should be noted that vinculin can also at, appear in adherence junctions, but if it does, it would spatially co-localize with beta catenin, which is not the case here. Hence, we can be certain that vinculin in green represents focal adhesions. To test whether the loss of adherence junctions between 0.3 kilopascal and 13 kilopascal was significant, we measured the total area of focal adhesions and adherence junctions. There was a statistically significant increase in focal adhesion area as E was increased from 0.3 kilopascal to 13 kilopascal. Concurrently, the cell-cell adherence junction area underwent a statistically significant decrease in size. We wanted to find out whether the formation of adherence junctions between cells in an ensemble would influence their overall contractility. Therefore, we constructed a simple mechanical equivalent of a 2 ASM ensemble with no cell-cell contacts. In order to do this, we considered isolated single ASM cells cultured on the rectangular patterns as before. The traction fields for each single cell was first calculated independently. Then we translated the coordinate system from the two independent traction force vector fields such that the two ASM cells were adjoined and aligned in the same direction. 
The vector fields at matching grids were added up vectorially to create a new traction field of this theoretical ensemble. We then calculated the contractile moment of this theoretical two cell pair with no cell cell junctions and compared this to the contractile moment of our experimental two cell pairs at 300 Pascal and 13 kilopascal. We found that at 0.3 kilopascal, which is healthy ECM, where the ASM ASM cell coupling was maximum, a connected two ASM cell ensemble has statistically significantly lower contractile strength in comparison with the two non-interacting ASM cells. This shows that the ASM ASM connections via adherence junctions are not merely a pathway for transmitting ASM force. Adherence junctions also allow the contractile apparatus of individual cells to interact in such a way that the contractile strength of the multicellular ensemble is significantly lower than the equivalent ensemble which connects through cell ECM focal additions rather than cell-cell adherence junctions. Comparing these results to the same scenario at E is equal to 13 kilopascal, which is remodeled ECM, where the ASM-ASM coupling was significantly lower, the net contractility of a connected two ASM cell ensemble was still lower than that of two non-interacting ASM cells, but the difference was no longer statistically significant. As ASM-ASM coupling decreases, each ASM cell in the ensemble starts to behave like a single cell connected to a stiffer ECM and the net contractile moment increases significantly. To summarize, the measurements made in the study were enabled by contactless micro-patterning technology using Primo. On soft substrates corresponding to healthy airways, the force transmission occurs more through direct cell-cell coupling. And direct cell-cell coupling also lowers the overall contractility of the multicellular ensemble. If the airways remodel in such a way that their ECM stiffness increases, then there is a switch in the force transmission pathway from cell-cell to cell-ECM based transfer. Further, the protective effect of cell-cell connectivity is also lost when ECM remodels and increases its stiffness. The combined effect of these two changes may be sufficient to drive a healthy human airway to become hyperreactive as seen in asthma. Therefore, ECM remodeling could be a primary pathway for the development of airway hyperreactivity in asthmatics. Thank you for your presentations, Harry and Manuel. It is now time for the Q&A. To ask the speakers a question, just type it in where it says type your question here and then press submit. So our first question, and this one asks, uh, on which type of substrate uh, can you make uh, micro patterns? Um, Manuel, is that something you can answer? Um, so far, uh, many substrates have been used, uh, first on glass, of course, and also on plastic layers, like polystyrene layers, that was also uh, spin-coated on glass slides. Um, it has also been made on uh, PDMS and uh, polyacrylamide gels, so which, is, which was challenging because polyacrylamide is particularly soft and contains water, so the contact, classical technique with contact are usually difficult to handle with those hydrogels but using Primo, it was possible to make patterns on those gels. And uh, that's the one I have in mind so far. Um, but I think it opens already quite a broad uh, range of applications from hydrogels to classical uh, cell substrate uh, culture. Excellent. Thanks, Manuel. And sort of following on from that, um, which type of proteins um, can be printed? Well, currently people have been using fibronectin because it's a very uh, ubiquitous uh, extracellular matrix protein. So many cells are sensitive uh, to uh, fibronectin. Uh, people have also tried to macro have managed to macro pattern collagen, um, laminin, um, and then uh, it's also it's also possible to macro pattern antibodies. So indirectly, by macro patterning antibodies, it is possible. This, this has many advantages because it opens the possibility. It protects the let's say it protects the protein that you are interested in.
because macro patterning can always have some drawbacks because the adsorption on the substrate can somehow impair the structure of the protein. The drying of the protein also can be can affect these uh, conformations. So by using antibodies, uh, it's possible to print the antibody, pattern the antibody, and then afterwards add the protein on, of interest on top of it so that the proteins, it's not directly in contact with the substrate. So I think that uh, extracellular matrix proteins and, and antibodies in general opens a uh, wide range of, of, of applications. Excellent. Thanks, Manuel. And our next question is for Harry. Uh, and this one asks, um, is it possible that the increased traction force with increase in ECM stiffness um, is the result of increased connection, so more efficient force transfer to the ECM, uh, with the um, ECM as opposed to higher cell contracted contractility. Ah. Harry, are you still there or you might still be on Sorry, mute? Sorry, I was on mute. Okay. Um, this is a good point. However, um, the force that a cell generates and the number of connections it forms with the ECM are not independent from each other. The binding of integrins and all the helper proteins that are associated with it, uh, for example, cyxin, they form uh, catch bonds which are stabilized by force. So the development of cellular force and the formation of mature focal adhesions are tightly correlated processes. You cannot separate one from the other. Um, so they occur together. Excellent. Thanks, Harry. And our next question asks, uh, what is the minimum or maximum size of micro pattern you can make with uh, Primo? Um, Manuel, is that something you can answer? Thanks, Harry. Uh, so I would say that the, the, minimum, uh, the minimum size depends on the objectives you use. And uh, I think that if you go to very high magnification objectives, like 100x, and then you are then limited also by the size of the pixels uh, from the Primo device. And the, minim, the smallest features that can be done are around one micron, between one and two micron, um, so which is already at the subcellular level. And um, so it's very easy to, to make structures that are uh, two, three, five, ten micron wide. And of course, it can be much bigger than that, and there is no clear limit to the maximal size, since uh, even uh, very big structures that could be at the millimeter size for people that are interested in tissue engineering could be done, because uh, the, the device, the primo device, can can make patterns sequentially on different positions. So it can, the pattern can be as huge as the range of your uh, motorized stage. So it can be even centimeter wide. Excellent. Thanks, Manuel. And our next question asks, uh, by using uh, your technology, uh, is it possible to detect pathogen identification ver at very low levels? So to this uh, question, I would say that um, it's not possible to, de well, it's to detect antigen. It's not designed for that but it's possible to characterize uh, anti um, pathogens so in, in several ways. So first, it's possible to, um, to impose some specific shape to the cells, uh, stretching uh, or compaction, and test how much the cell shape and uh, contraction affect the, the invasion of the pathogens, so whether they can invade easier or uh, less easier, uh, more difficult, more, uh, with more difficulty, the, the cells that are that are stretched or whether they are compacted. So the cell, how the cell density can impact invasiveness. And regardless of the invasion capacities, it's possible also to study how a cells, how pathogens can interact with the substrate, because it, there are some studies that have shown that depending on the texture of the substrate, uh, biofilms can be formed. Uh, more or less efficiently. So um, maybe uh, I, I'll try to use the, um, the chat in order to provide some references showing that micro patterning uh, of uh, flat but also uh, uh, um, uh, devices for surgery 
can be macro patterns and impact the adhesion of biofilms and thus uh, the possibility of uh, further infections once implanted. Excellent. Thanks, Manuel. And just a quick reminder to our live audience, you still have time to ask a question. To ask one, all you need to do is type it in where it says type your question here and then press submit. So our next question, uh, and I think this one's also directed to you, Manuel, uh, and it asks, uh, is it possible to prepare any drug by using this technology uh, which can be used in MDR therapy? Uh, <laughs> I don't know what MDR uh, therapy is, and I don't think this device is suited to 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 make or to synthesize the drug, but it can definitely be used to characterize the impact of the drug on cell physiology, cell architecture, and cell fate. So the the, the aim of macro patterning is to normalize cells in order to help uh, automatization of uh, their 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 response and the image analysis. So, and there are many, many examples now showing that um, you can uh, expose cells to control drugs or to your drug of interest and compare uh, their, their cytoskeleton, their polarity, and their ability to differentiate. Excellent. Thanks, Manuel. And our next question asks, um, is this ECM remodeling um, uh, sorry, uh, can this uh, ECM remodeling be applied um, sort of within clinical biology? Uh, who would like um, to maybe that? I can take that question. Um, uh, thanks, Harry. So, uh, in this particular work that I just presented, uh, we were looking at ECM remodeling in the context of asthma. So, um, to answer your question, it depends on the kind of ECM remodeling that occurs in the disease that you're interested in. It could be changes in mechanical properties, like we looked at here with changes in ECM stiffness. It could be compositional changes, or uh, perhaps uh, you know in the uh, anisotropy and the structure of the ECM. I believe with micro patterning, you can actually address all these questions, individually looking at composition changes, uh, stiffness changes, in in the disease that you're interested in. Excellent. Thanks, Harry. And our next question asks, uh, for how long can micro patterns last? Um, is that something you can answer, Manuel? Uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> so usually, because this, this technique allows to, to produce a micro pattern on demand, and, and, and so the, the general way to use it is to use micro patterns straight away, because you don't any, anyway produce uh, very uh, large amount of macro patterns, so it's, it's usually on a day-to-day -day basis for uh, immediate use. But macro patterns can be stored; they can be made in advance for a few days. Uh, um, we don't, I don't have much experience on longer time scales, and I think that if there could be some problems, it would be rather with the anti-fooling coating that can be degraded rather than the macro pattern itself. Excellent. Thanks, Manuel. And our next question is also for you, and this one asks, uh, is it possible to control the thickness of the uh, photopolymerized hydrogel uh, layer in the Z dimensions with, with the Primo system? Uh, and then specifically, is it possible to prepare uh, geometrically defined micro, in, micro environments for single cells in 3D? Okay, so that's okay. That's a very specific question. So um, I would say that the the thickness depends on the the depth um, of focus of the objective, but this is not very well controlled because when you there is no other constraint, uh, the, this this thickness is not very uh, well defined and it's not very sharp. So what can be done is to it's to use a microfluidic uh, channels or a microfluidic chamber in order to impose the the, the roof uh, size so that uh, it is filled with capi by capillarity so that you have a controlled uh, thickness that is non uh, non polymerized so that once you shine the light uh, with the primo device uh, it will polymerize the entire thickness between your glass light and the PDMS. Uh, a macrofluidic device. 
And so far, I think that uh, thickness that I've heard about are between few micron and can be up to 100 microns. Uh, and there is in the publication in BioArchive on the uh, photo degradation by uh, Pasturel, there is a control of the thickness also of the, the height, uh, control of the height of the photopolymerized uh, layer. And to the second part of the question about uh, geometrically defined for single cells in 3D, so yes, of course, then if, if you control the height, let's say 10 micron to fit with a single cell or even 20 micron, then depending on the shape, shape of the light that you polymerize, if it's, if, if it's cell-sized, you can photopolymerize a cube that would be, uh, whose height would be controlled by the macrofluidic uh, channel, and the, the dimension in X and Y would be controlled by the, the, the pattern of light. So yes, it is possible to have a 3D, 3D confiner. Excellent. Thanks, Manuel. And our next question is for Harry. Uh, and this audience member says they are quite surprised you didn't see uh, venicillin at the cell-cell adhesion in the presence of higher stiffness. Uh, they're wondering, have you tried with uh, venicillin TS sensors from the uh, Swartz group? Uh, and also, uh, they'd be curious to know about uh, catenin at the cell-cell adhesion. Uh, have you inferred anything about confirmation of these proteins? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, this is actually a very good question. In fact, uh, when we started this work, we actually expected to see the opposite result. We thought that we would see stronger cell-cell bonds uh, on higher stiffnesses, on higher rhesium stiffnesses. Um, and this is because there's uh, previous work from Dr. Dale Tang's lab which shows that uh, if you actually activate smooth muscle with uh, acetylcholine, um, the cell-cell bonds become stronger, and they are indeed a catch bond, so that's what you would expect. But um, strangely enough, that's not what we found. Uh, both are mechanical measurements of cell-cell uh, coupling, the index I, which I showed, and uh, the fluorescent imaging shows that the opposite is happening, that uh, you know the cell-cell borders go away and they give way to cell lecium contacts. Um, so I believe that this is actually not, uh, there is some mechanism that's going on here which is independent of uh, mechanics because it goes in the opposite direction of smooth muscle force. Um, we haven't actually looked at alpha catenin, but we have looked at uh, beta catenin staining and uh, co-localized with uh, catherins, and they do co-localize. Um, and we haven't looked at the conformation of these proteins. But whatever is happening here seems to be a, independent mechanism. Excellent. Thanks, Harry. And uh, just a quick reminder to our live audience, you still have time to ask a question. All you need to do is type it in where it says type your question here and then press submit. So our next question asks, um, do the anti-fouling uh, polymer and photo initiator need to be deposited sequentially uh, and are both uh, proprietary? Um, Manuel, is that something you can answer? So yes, I, I would say it is recommended to first uh, uh, coat with the anti-fouling polymer and then uh, use add the, the photo initiator to, to destroy it with the light. Uh, personally, I haven't tried to do them together, um, which would mean that the photo initiator would be embedded into the anti-fouling hydrogel layer. Maybe it could work, uh, but maybe it could work. It can be tried. I, I, I'm not clear about that, but the classical way to, provide, to proceed is to, to, to make them sequentially. Then about the proprietary, so the anti-fouling, there are many companies providing different ways of uh, anti-fouling polymers, uh, and not only from uh, alveol, it can come from other uh, companies. Um, and this, there are several uh, methods paper about how to code with anti-fouling uh, substrate. And maybe uh, uh, that person can contact me directly to, to discuss this in more detail. So this is this is not specific to uh, prime to uh, alveol. About the photo initiator, there are also alternatives, known some that are already been very much used in the field, like Irgacure is a very popular one that have been used for uh, hydrogel photopolymerization. 
but those ones are much less uh, efficient than the PLPP that is sold uh, by uh, alveol. So, and this efficiency is important because it reduces the, the, the amount of light and the duration of the exposure that is required to, to get the pattern done. So with PLPP, it can take few seconds, whereas with others, it would take uh, 10, if not more, uh, 10 times longer and probably more as well. So um, and there are several possibilities. Perfect. Thanks, Manuel. And our next question asks, uh, what is the uh, resolution limit with this system? Um, when the patterning is done on gels, so for example, uh, matrix gel, PAA, PEG, um, is the resolution limit the same? Um, Manuel, is that something you can also answer? Yes. So on, so on our side, uh, we, we haven't tried matrix gel, uh, but it, it is probably it is likely that the resolution will be diminished when you have very thick layers because, of course, the light has to pass uh, through those layers. So probably the resolution will, will be lower. We have tried uh, um, uh, polyacrylamide patterning, and the polyacrylamide layer was about, uh, I think, something like 100 micron thick. And of course, you adapt your focus, you, 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 make, you adapt, adapt it to the top of the layer. And we managed to make some lines that were lower, I think around 5 microns easily, and I, I guess it could be lower, so I can't give you the exact limit, but still it is uh, very possible to make subcellular uh, structures. Excellent. Thanks, Manuel. And our next question asks, um, does the polymer needed for the uh, patterning, um, the PLPP, uh, need to be purchased from the company? Um, Manuel, so that's something you can answer. Yeah, the PLPP is uh, proprietary, so it it it, it has been uh, developed by Alveol, so uh, it has to be uh, purchased from them. And uh, yeah. Excellent. Thanks, Manuel. And our next question asks: uh, Is the uh, photo initiator toxic to cells? Uh, if so, is it possible that some of the initiator remains after the process is complete? Uh, and do you see any effects on the cells? Um, Manuel, is that something you can answer? Yeah. So definitely, uh, this photo initiator, uh, as all the others, is phototoxic. Uh, and particularly this one, I guess, because it is very efficient, because the radicals that are produced to make the patterns can also uh, uh, affect the cells. So the washing out, the step during which the, the photo initiator is washed out is very important. So, so this is a key step in the microfabrication process. Uh, once it has been exposed, once the substrate has been exposed to light, uh, it has to be washed extensively, and there are some specific uh, fluidic chambers in order to 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 make it uh, to make it easier. But yes, it has to be removed. Uh, some traces can remain, uh, but so far we haven't seen uh, much toxic effect when we do uh, 2D uh, uh, micro patterning, and cells afterwards uh, survive very well on it. Perfect. Thanks, Manuel. Well, I'm afraid that is all we have time for today. Uh, before you leave us, we would really appreciate if you can spare a few seconds to fill in a very quick survey on your experience today. I would now like to thank Dr. Manuel Thierry and Dr. Harry Krishnan Paramashwaran for their presentations and for answering your questions. I would also like to thank the webcast sponsors, Alveoli, and of course you, the audience, for taking the time to be with us today. Remember, you can watch this webcast again at any time on demand at nature.com webcasts. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join us again soon.